So hi, I'm I'm Rafael, um, and uh, before I start, I'd like to say that I'm going to present. Uh, what I'm going to present is like very very early stage in development. I started development developing it uh, basically when Dimitri asked if I had something to present. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but these are ideas that I had been having for a while. I just didn't uh, implement it. Um, and it had been a while since I had done some common list. Uh, and then maybe a few months ago, Dimitri started talking in the hallways about this. And, uh, and I sort of had forgotten how fun it is to, to actually code in common list. So thanks, Dimitri. And uh, so on my little language, this is an example of an expression. This is a uh, rhythm. It has three uh, figures. Uh, the second one has twice the duration of the first, and the third one has uh, three fourths of the second. This is how you define a constant uh, with an expression. This is how you apply a function. Uh, and this is equivalent to this. So basically, I double the duration of each figure in my rhythm. Uh, I can also tell it to print my function. And it sh should tell me how it's defined. So it's a lambda with two arguments that maps this inner function over the sequence. Um, and in fact, this is how, how it was defined. Uh, this is another example of a function definition. It does sort of the opposite of the other one, and here we can see a little bit more of the syntax of the language. Uh, there's a lambda with two parameters, uh, a fold function uh, being called with another lambda. There's a case uh, that does a case analysis on the result of calling the uh, figure division. Uh, and there's a case in case the value return was created with inject left and created with inject right, and this this uh, figure division returns this this uh, this value uh, because not all divisions gener generate valid rhythms because you may divide since it's an integer division it may lead to to zero. Um, another example of function application this is equivalent to this. So basically the sum of all durations. Uh, this is its implementation and shows a little bit more the syntax of the language. So you have if, you have the let to do local bindings. And this also shows you know, how we do loops. So you do from a number to another number with the initial value that you're going to accumulate and the function that it will accumulate upon. So it gets the index, the accumulator, and the function to compute the next step. So if you want to leave the loop earlier, you just don't call that function. If you want to go forward, you pass the next value of the accumulator to it. So uh, this function basically walks over the whole uh, rhythm and sums its durations. I have to explicitly consider the empty case and uh, for the empty rhythm that the duration is zero. And uh, this is uh, more to show you how the language looks like. If you're actually defining this function here, you would use a fold instead of doing the loop manually. Um, but we have seen with this example that we have commands such as define and print, which are not actual functions. You can't call define and you can't call print in the middle of your actual code. They are more of a way to interact with the, with the, with the system. 
and we also have expressions which are where you actually do your stuff, write your program. Um, and this, what I have shown, covers almost everything of the language. What we haven't seen yet is uh, the literals, true/false, the unit the unit value, which is useful when you don't really have anything to say. Arithmetic operators, uh, functions to create a sum. So you inject left and, or you inject on the right, and then you do a case analysis to extract uh, the value. And you can't extract in any other way, so you always have to consider both cases if the value that you're dealing with was created like this. Um, we also have tuples that I haven't shown. They can be an array tuple, so uh, pairs and triples and four tuples and whatever. And uh, this is sort of the anti-climax. Um, the language doesn't do much. Uh, and I'm sort of claiming that it is a language for music, and it actually just has that, and it's dealing with integers. So I, I realize that it's a bit of a hard sell. Uh, wouldn't it be easier to write a library in an actual language and have less limitations? Or uh, yeah, but I, I, I claim I claim that this is a. Uh, a valid language for this, and I hope that as my talk goes along, you'll see that my delusion has some merit. But still, as I said, it's early stage, so I'm mostly going to talk about what I have implemented so far, because I think there are some nice things to say about uh, the way I do evaluation and the uh, time inference algorithm. Uh, so more characteristics about the language. It has no way for you to give it input. It also produces no output. There are no unbounded loops. And, uh, but the good thing is that it already has a compiler. It <laughs> compiles to C. <laughs> it has two optimization passes uh, already, the compiler. First one is constant folding. Second one is dead code elimination. And this is an example of a code produced by a compiler. So. Why would you write code in a language like this? It basically, it does nothing. Nothing. And and this is sort of one of the things that I remember most fond fondly about Common Lisp is that uh, due to the way that you write your programs and you interact with it closely, and as you write them, you also refine your th your thoughts about the thing that you're coding. So the process of coding is both a process of developing your programs and of developing your intuition and your thoughts about the things that you're uh, developing. And this is something that, re that I remember uh, very uh, fondly, this, this short, uh, this very tight feedback loop. And uh, the thing is that this, uh, this, uh, this way of working is very useful, even if the end output isn't necessarily a program that you're going to run on your server or something like that. Because if the programs that you're writing have some connection uh, with some extra external uh, area of knowledge or system that you're trying to understand better, just writing them, writing these programs in this manner with a system that helps you develop your thoughts is a big thing in itself. Because it leads you to refine your thoughts, uh, sorry, to develop your thoughts further in directions that maybe you wouldn't have, or with an ease that maybe you wouldn't have in other way. Um, yeah. So, uh, but before going further, further, let me just talk about uh, the rhythm representation that I'm using for for these examples. There. Are at least uh, for purposes of this talk, there are two different views of rhythm. The first one I call divisive rhythm, for lack of a better name. And uh, this is basically the kind of rhythm where you have a beat, and everything is heard in reference to the beat. So for example, if I want to play faster, I divide my beat by two, 
So now I have I'm twice as fast. I can do this. Uh, I can divide by three, by four. Uh, as I said, a bit. Let's call it x. Then, if you want a faster rhythm, you do x divided by two. Uh, this is an example of a rhythm. The first one lasts half a bit. The first figure lasts half a bit. The other two lasts uh, less two uh, fourth of a bit each. You can go even further. Um, you can divide by three, which is what we usually call tri triplets. And you can also multiply, so have durations longer than the beat. But the main thing here, uh, despite the bad naming of a divisive, ry divisive, ry divisive rhythm, is that you're always doing things in relation to the beat. The other way of representing rhythm is through what I call and not only the additive rhythms, which is instead of having a bit as a reference, you have the, the minimum uh, duration that you're interested in. Uh, let's call it k. And all your other durations, all your other rhythm fi rhythmic figures are multiples of this uh, minimum that you're interested in. So for example, you have the other figure that is 2k, less twice as the minimum. You have the other figure that is 3k. You can write sort of complex, more complex rhythms uh, like this. If you were to write this in Lisp with a Z, uh, it would look like this. And this is an example like this, the, the array looping term in the middle. And this is an, another example of a command in the system. I can tell it to extract this array using this extraction method with this extra metadata that is passed to this method. And this is generated. Uh, for those who, who, who understand a little bit of musical notation, I hope, hopefully the connection is uh, clear. Um, so I'm using the, the minimum of a bit, the 16th note. So this is uh, three, two, one, four, three. Anyway, there's a really good paper uh, that uh, applies this perspective of additive rhythm to the music of Messiaen, and uh, short of, and does an analysis on this pieces and uh, discusses it really well. So I really recommend it if you're uh, interested in this kind of thing. Um, and I, I had I read this paper a, a while ago, and uh, but I always had it in my mind because what they do there is that they have a really um, they develop a notation and an algebraic uh, uh, system where they have operations and rhythms. So, for example, the concaten concatenation of rhythms, so which is which is playing one after the other, and uh, composing rhythms, which is playing one on top of the other. So you hear the result as if they were a single one, just because they were played simultaneously. And that they develop another op other operations as well. Um, anyway, this processing. As I said, this kind of this, this, uh, this, uh, this perspective of rhythm uh, was always in the back of my mind. And if you're a, a, a musician who writes programs, there's a good chance that you have re-implemented uh, music-related operations over and over in multiple languages. So I had experience with that as well. Um, and I always had this idea that uh, a really, really simple language with functions and integers uh, would probably be good enough to do music analysis on. And uh, due to be a, being a simple language, you could make a really cool environment for people to program in. Um, and a few, also a few months ago, but less months, uh, Mikey came up with this beautiful name. So I decided that now is the time to do it. So thanks, Mikey. Uh, yeah, so implementation. Uh, these are, let's say, the first lines of my implementation of, uh, of this language. First lines after the uses modules, of course, where I define this this macros, 
the def class plus is just a def class with uh, defaults that I like. Uh, this is a bit of an anti pattern, I guess, but. Uh, and multi is basically a map for macros. Here's the implementation of multi. It basically calls the macro uh, with each of these parameters, and you can give the first parameters to, to, the, to the macro that you're calling as well, if they're common to all uh, operations, so it's really simple. And uh, actually, if we macro expand it, this is the result. Uh, yeah, so, so multi is a uh, really simple uh, death class plus I won't uh, go into detail. But uh, here I'm defining a parent class for the terms in my language. So if let lambda function application uh, all the literals, I also define a, a child class called atomic term. Another child class called uh, F-like, which is stands for function-like, and another ch uh, child class called for integer operator operators that inherits from F-like. And uh, these child classes they have no uh, slots of their own. And this is uh, a thing that I like doing in Common Lisp because. Uh, I end up using these parent classes as sort of tags to dispatch upon. They don't really carry information on, the, on their own besides uh, tagging the, the classes to which I apply them. And this is an anti-pattern that I like as well. Uh, actual terms, uh, function application, lambda, let, if, case and tuple. Uh, we have seen them all in examples so far, uh, with the exception of tuples. But they're just tuples. Um, Function-like operations, so the loop that we saw, looping up and down. Uh, comparing integers, uh, equality between terms, division, and inject left and right. Uh, in the actual code, it's a single macro let with all the macros and the a file listing my classes, but I split it up for better presentation. Um, integer operators. Here, uh, I show another feature of the that class plus. Um, if if the first slot is a list, the things in this list are the are class slots. Uh, so class variables, static variables, whatever you call them. So I have negation, uh, I call this absolute value, addition, subtraction, and multiplication. And division is in the is in is a function like if you're missing it, uh, because it actually returns a tuple which is with the the quotient and the remainder. So it doesn't fit in my view of uh, integer operators, which are int to int to int. Atomic terms are the terms that have no subterms. So, so far, uh, for example, the lambda carries an expression, the let carries two expressions. If carries three expressions, the atomic terms carry none. So this is the, the, the Boolean true, the Boolean false, the unit value, an integer literal, and variables. And I have two different types of variables, which is uh, it's purely an implementation detail, doesn't uh, make a difference for, for, for the language user. Uh, which are bound variables and uh, free variables. I'll talk about them later and why I have this, this division. Okay, so this is an example of, uh, of, uh, of a term in the language. It's actually a not valid term. <laughs> this is a valid term, a free variable x. This is an integer literal. This is what I'm showing is the syntax tree of the of the program, right? And this are, of course, very simple program. This is just five. Um, and what that class plus also does is it generates a function that takes the, the slots as arguments without uh, keyword operators. Another example of a program, just a literal true. Another example, uh, this time with the actual uh, concrete syntax. 
this has this abstract syntax. Uh, lambda has this uh, abstract syntax. And here, the binder shows up, um, which I haven't talked about yet. Uh, lambda with two arguments is actually sugar for two lambdas, which it, each with their own binders. Um, and to understand the distinction between uh, bound and free variables, uh, you have to understand the idea of a locally nameless representation of variables. Um, and also, it's good to understand the idea of a binder. So I'll start with the binder. Uh, this is the definition of a lambda. It inherits from term, and it's just an expression. So despite what you may have expected, um, there's no uh, slot for a variable there, or variable name, or whatever. Same thing for let, which is another term that also should bind the variable. It only has the expression that is to be put in the variable and the actual body of the let, which will be evaluated and uh, constitute the value of the, the expression. Same thing for case, which also binds variables in it. Um, and then comes the binder, which actually has a place to store a variable name and an expression. So the idea of a binder is to abstract away the, 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 the idea of a variable binding into a single object and then reuse it everywhere. Because then you get it right once and you don't have to, don't have to worry about it. So the binder abstracts the idea of this is a variable binding. This variable is valid in this scope of this expression and nowhere else. Um, so when you're constructing a lambda or a let or a case, which are the, the terms that have uh, variable bindings, what you do is you wrap the things uh, uh, on which the, var the variable is uh, valid with binders. Oh, I have the, I forgot the, to remove the, the prefix from binders. That my latest version doesn't have that. Um, so let me go back and and forth again. So let x inject left two. Case of case x of inject left y returns y. Um, if it's uh, in right, it returns minus one. And uh, as you can, see, you, you'll be able to see um, the let will have a binder with the x there, and the case has. Uh, Two binders, one for each case, one with y and one with uh, the underscore variable, which is uh, to say that this variable isn't used. Okay, now back to the locally nameless representation. Uh, you have to understand the difference between the bound variables and free variables. Um, for bound variables, we use uh, the Brine uh, indices, which is uh, Dutch guy. Um, and the idea is that um, you you represent bound variables by the 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 position from where it was bound. Uh, so, for example, here we have uh, three. I explicitly listed the, the three lambdas like this to be easier to see. Um, since the, the the last variable c is the first is the first one in the in the scopes in the in the in the nested bindings, its index is zero. Let's say that it was uh, b, then the index would be one because zero is c, and one is uh, b is one. If it was a, it would be two. And uh, that's basically how I represent bound variables. Um, and bound variables are basically these variables that are locally bound by lambda, by let, by a case. Um, this is just to show that the three lambdas are actually, uh, sorry, that this is sugar for the three uh, separate lambdas. It's uh, at, at the abstract syntax level, it's the same thing. Uh, a more complex example. 
So in this one, you see that in the scope of the outer binder that binds the A, A is the bound variable zero. But in the inner scope, A is the bound variable one, while B is uh, zero. Is, is this clear? Where is the second thing? Second is here. So multiplication of A and B. I don't have any fixed operators, uh, but your, your list breaks, you shouldn't complain again. Uh, <laughs> maybe for the lack of parentheses. Uh, OK, so this is the, so the lambda, this lambda is here, here. So a binder with B, multiplication, A, because it's in the second uh, scope. So it's 1, because it's zero indexed, and B, which is the closest one in scope. Um, and one of the advantages of doing this is that uh, it's easier uh, to compare terms for equality because let's say you had lambda x x and lambda y y so two id functions but with different variables if you store the name you always have to do a conversion before comparing them in order to see if they're equal. And like this, they are normalized. And what's the purpose of the actual name? And why the uh, this is just debugging. No, no, it's just because the language is, uh, has, or at least it's supposed to be it eventually, uh, to have some interactivity. It, it has already, but it's not there yet. Um, so it's just for. Um, when I read programs, I transform them and then I print them back. I print them with their original. Ah, so you know what? Yeah, what exactly. to what. Yeah. yeah, I could generate them back with uh, different variable names. It would be semantically the same, but then it's confusing for the user. So, if possible, I keep the the name that the user gave. If not possible, I add a prime to it, and I'll talk about it later. Uh, another example. Uh, no, sorry. This is already introducing introducing three variables. Uh, so three variables are variables that are not bound in the context of the code that you're looking at. That's, that's I think a good intuitive notion. Um, so in the case of written duration, for example, it's because it's like a library thing. Eventually, I'll look this into the environment and I'll do the, the substitution. But the idea is that it's not bound in the, context, in the context of the code that I'm looking at. And this can also happen because, for example, uh, due to transformations in the code that you're doing, you have walked through the syntax tree and you're focusing on a, on a small bit of code. For example, you forget for, uh, you're not looking at the actual lambdas. So in order to do that, the ideal thing is that you replace the bound variables with free variables. Because otherwise, if you move, move them, them around, since they are uh, identified by their position uh, in, in regards to the scoping, it's likely that they're going to lose meaning. So if you're doing transformations, it's uh, you usually um, transform your bound variables in free variables, which corresponds to the notion that in the piece of code that you would be looking at, they're not bound anymore. Um, this is a function to compute, compute the set of free variables in a term. Um, so the actual core of the function is this equal uh, inner function. Just looks over the terms. If it's a free variable, then uh, with, with looks uh, uh, folds over the terms with an accumulator. If it's a free variable, first case, it adds it to the set the accumulator and returns that. If it's an atomic term, then it obviously has no free variables because it has no nested stuff. It's a literal. Uh, if it's a binder, you look into its expression. If it's a, any other term, you look in, into all its slot values because since I know that they're not atomic, what they contain are sub-expressions. And then I reduce it, adding whatever I got from that uh, to the set that I'm accumulating. 
and to, to initialize the process I pass it an empty set. So for example, for the previous case, it would return a set with uh, the bigger than uh, symbol and the string and the written duration string, because these are the two free variables in this uh, piece of code. Uh, and this is the function that I mentioned that uh, sometimes you, you get the code, you do a transformation, maybe you evaluate, but you don't evaluate all, or you evaluate under just a specific piece of the code and not all of it. Um, and sometimes you have to generate uh, new variable names because you're replacing bound variables with free variables. Um, and it may happen that the name is taken already. Um, if that's the case, uh, I need to generate another name. So what I do is I just keep appending the uh, quotes, uh, primes, until I find one that isn't taken. Uh, this is the function to what we call opening the, a term, in this case, uh, opening a binder, a little bit more specific, uh, which is the process of uh, replacing a bound variable with a term. So what it does is that I, you give it a binder and the thing to replace the variable for. So guess the expression uh, that the binder contains and start with a zero. If the expression is a term, sorry, if the term is a, the expression is a bound variable, then it compares the number it has, which is zero at the start with the ID of the variable. Uh, if they match, then this is the, a, a variable that I'm talking about in the replace. Um, if it's not a bound variable and it's an atomic term, I do nothing because there are no variables there. Um, skipping the binder, if it's, and then I keep uh, digging deeper, looking into the each um, uh, sub-expressions of the term that I'm looking at. The thing is that every time I cross through a binder, I know that my indices have uh, increased because I, I, I go deeper in the scope. So the variable that I'm looking for that used to have ID zero now has ID one. And I cross a different binder and now it has ID two. Um, yeah, so that's how you replace. So for example, this is how you could uh, apply a function. You get its binder, then you call this function with the, the value that you're passing as a, as a parameter, as an argument. Um, this is uh, a wrapper around the other function to so open a binder with a free variable. Uh, so it just basically gets the, the, the variable name from the binder, sees if it's a good name. If it is, it uses that to open. So it will replace the, the bound variables with free variable. And you have the opposite expression, which is the opposite function, which is to close the binder. So um, get the free variable with the given name and replace it with a bound variable. So, so it's as you go deeper into 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 the code, you have to replace bounds with free. As as you pop back, you have to do the opposite thing. Um, yeah, and this is the I guess the the important function. This is the function that evaluates my terms. Uh, and as you can see, it's an iteration over the term. I keep account of how many, how many steps I, I have uh, done, just for information purposes. Uh, and it's so eventually be good to inform the user. And on each, uh, on each iteration, I call the function reduction step with the term that I'm uh, reducing and the environment. If that return returns new, it means that it can't be reduced further, so I need to stop evaluating. If it returns uh, a true truthy value, then I keep uh, trying to reduce it. And the cool thing about this is that I do it one step at a time, and that all my, uh, let's say, semantic operation in this function is in the reduction step, which is a generic function. Um, so this puts me into the position that 
since I, I, I will specialize this function for each of the kinds of terms that I have, uh, the, the answer that I have to, to provide every time I implement this function is, uh, okay, I, get, I have this term. How do I, how, how do I evaluate it uh, one step more? Um, the first one is easy. If it's an atomic term, it's a literal. I do not think there's, I can't evaluate true further. I can't evaluate false further. Except if it's a free variable, then I look it up in the context. If it's there, I return the value. If it's not, it's a free variable that I don't know about, so I return you because I can't evaluate it further. But it doesn't mean that my program is correct because the interaction, st the interaction style allows the user to try to evaluate a piece of code that is not the whole thing. So by definition, there, there will be times when I'm trying to eva evaluate a piece of code without knowing all the context because it's a free variable for me, but it's not a, a variable that I was defined in the library. It's a lambda that is outside of my scope, for example. OK, so I have a macro to, to so that I don't have to call that method manually. That's basically the reason. And I call it with motive. And then, because uh, then uh, I, I sort of like the, 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 the aesthetics of the file, that there's a, a case, a block of code for each term, the type of term that I'm, uh, that I'm evaluating. So on the next slides, I will, I will show just each of these blocks, but uh, keep in mind that it's uh, reduction rule macro that I'm calling, which is which basically calls the reductions defines the reduction step method, but before that it uh, opens the slots of the terms. This is a uh, classic one. If I have a if, how do I go further? So I have another macro, which is called single step. And I try to single step test. And what single step does is it calls reduction step on all its uh, all the variables in each in its first uh, form. The first one that doesn't return new, it re it rebinds rebinds it to the new value that it got, so the reduced value, and uh, stops and calls the first uh, the first clause. If all return new, that, that is, I couldn't uh, evaluate any of my sub-expressions further, I call the else branch. Uh, so first case, I could evolve the test further. So I return the if, because remember, I'm doing this one step at a time. So let's say that the test wasn't a literal true. It was true and false. So this next step of evaluation is to return false. So I build a new if with the new test. If I can't evaluate the test further, I do a type case on it. If it's true, I return my then branch, still unevaluated. If it's false, I return my else branch, still unevaluated. So I'm keeping with this idea of uh, doing it one step at a time. The case is sort of similar, but uh, Each case that it has also carries some information. So it binds variables. Uh, so I need to open the binder with the value that I got from the, the expression in, the, in case uh, that I'm doing case analysis on. So if after I can't evaluate the expression anymore, it's an, uh, it was constructed with inject left. I do the first case, I get its value, and I open the binder. If it's inject right, I do the, the same thing, but with the inject right uh, branch. Function application. I single step both func and arg. When I can't do it anymore, if it's a lambda, I basically open the binder with the arg as a replacement for the variable. If it's a function like, which is sort of a primitive function, there are arithmetic operators. It's the, I, I bind the argument and bind arg once it's full. Like, uh, for example, the plus has its both its operators. It uh, 
actually computes the thing. Let single step the expression when it's done opens the binding. Um, yeah, so this is an example, uh, let's say an example small program. Um, and uh, the reason that I that I defined and implemented my language in this uh, small step uh, sort of semantics is that, as I said, what I want with it is, is not uh, produce a program that is going to be run. So I don't care that much about uh, certain things. But one thing that I care about is to be able to single step my program, because since the programs that I'm writing correspond to musical structures, I want to be able to see how the structure that I have defined maps to an actual piece of music. And as the computation unfolds, I'll be able to see how my dense and compressed notation uh, actually transforms itself step by step into actual notes and actual uh, rhythms, uh, durations. Um, so, for, in this case, for example, I start with a cell, like a, a three-note, three-figure rhythm, all with the same duration. I create this, uh, and I start it in A. I create a constant C, dividing it by two. Uh, you can ignore the suffix there, it's just a, a way to tell that it's a positive number. Um, I increment the the figure at position one of C, and I, uh, I name this B. Uh, I add a one to the to the result of incrementing all in C, and I call it D. I get the first two figures of B, and I call it E. I increment a figure of the. Um, oh, it's missing an argument there. Should be D, I think. I'm missing an argument here. But I augment the rhythm, uh, I, I double it, and I increase the one at position uh, one uh, increment. And I create a sequence with all these rhythms combined. And here, in, as an example of how I do a canon, a canon is basically a, a piece of music where each voice sings the same thing, but delayed with variation to the to the other voices. So I start thing, singing something, and then someone else waits maybe a bar or half a bar and starts singing the same thing. And then the third voice does that. So the way I do this is uh, I have an array with X, my original rhythm, built from the cells that were developed. I call delay X with four, so wait uh, four units before you start. and. Uh, Delay x wait eight units. I repeat it, it. I repeat each of these rhythms twice, and I crop the rhythm so that it ends as soon as the first one ends. I call this canon, and I extract it with the same extraction method. So these are all uh, constants. It's not uh, delayed uh, duration. No, no, no. That's confusing. Yeah, it's it's delaying time. So it's basically. Add pauses to the big because this is a really. Uh, the, the, the code itself is all uh, constants in there, right? So if I yeah. change A in the beginning, then uh, X stays the same as it was, right? So if I run, uh, if I run this code and then I change A, then X uh, remains so what it was. Right? You mean it's not reactive, right? It's like if you change A, then C does not change its value. It doesn't recompute. Okay, is that the question? Ah, yes, that's the question. Okay. Um, yes and no. Um, it is a little bit. Uh, so what I do is I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it at the end. But I I index all things that you create with the the things that it depend upon. It depends on. Uh, and since this is to be used interactively, every time you change something, I notify you of everything that is affected. Um, 
that's basically it. If you modify something and still keep its type, I say that, uh, okay, your, your change affected this. If you modify something, but you change its type, I say you, you broke this other thing, because now it doesn't uh, type check anymore. I have a question. And this kind of is sequential, right? It's not parallel. It's parallel. Uh, it's, it's an array of three rhythms. That's, that's the, I guess, that's the best answer I can give. But for the extraction method additive rhythm, it's in parallel. Okay. But that's how the, this extraction method uh, wants to, to interpret it. You can have a different one that does it differently. Yeah, so this delay isn't, uh, isn't uh, like schemes delay. It's uh, basically add four units of pulse before this rhythm. So that when they're played together, the second voice waits a little bit before it starts. And if I, if I actually run this, uh, try to extract the kennel, this is the result. Uh, the score generation needs to be improved. I use Lilypon, awesome software. Um, and it's correct, but it's not as a human that likes the human that's going to play it would write. Um, but you can see that the effect of the delay here. This is a pause. This is uh, also a pause with the same, this, uh, with the, uh, the double of the duration, which is what I asked for. Here is four units, here is uh, eight units. Um, if they look different, and you're not used to musical notation, it's just because the, the bar lines forces, forces us to split the figures and the sides, so they end up looking different if you had no bars. So just straight straight uh, through these, uh, they would all look the same, uh, just regarding the delay, of course. Yeah, so another um, pause. So if you look at the piano, uh, it has sets of 12 keys. We actually have a piano. It has sets of 12 keys, um, counting uh, white and black keys. And then it repeats itself. If you focus just on the black, the black one, you can see that at each five, there's a new there's a repetition. And then we call this an octave, because there are seven white notes. But in principle, there are 12, right? If you count uh, black and white. Uh, seven white, five black. Uh, and then it repeats itself. So the first one of this set, uh, first one for historical reasons, I guess, is C. Uh, and then as it repeats, it's C again. And then the other one, all, if you take the first one of each repetition, all of them are C. The second one for, is always C sharp or B flat. And uh, so you sort of identify uh, the corresponding ones in each of these uh, modules, repetition modules, as the same thing, or, or better yet, as equivalent. So you can describe these things as integers module 12. And that's actually a very common uh, way to, to structure analysis of certain kinds of pieces because it al allows you to see certain things that are dif more difficult to see if you're looking at notes. So for example, if you look, we call this uh, pitch classes. Uh, so it's pitch class zero, which is C, pitch class one, which is C sharp or B flat, pitch class seven, which is G. Uh, so you can say, tell someone play a zero four seven, and they will play a major chord. If you say play 037, they'll play a minor chord. And uh, with numbers, for example, it's easy to see that 047 and 037 are actually the inverse of each other. Of each other. Because 037 uh, has a 3 and a 4 as intervals, whereas 047 has a 4 and a 3. And this, this, this notation with numbers allows us to see certain things that are harder to see with, uh, without them, not that this particular example wasn't uh, discussed before we started doing this. So maybe it's not good. Uh, and, uh, but for example, um, 
So this is, as I showed you the language, we basically only have integers as, 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 uh, as uh, data types. Besides the, the other ones, we use to construct uh, deeper structures like doubles and sums and uh, arrays. Um, but pitch classes are basically integers, right? For example, I could make a tuple of pitch class and duration and call this a, a note because it has a duration and a pitch class. If I want an actual pitch, uh, if I want one actual, actually, the slides think different than me. Um, <laughs> so, if I want to represent uh, a pitch that could either be a pitch or a rest, which is like a figure that, sorry, a note that could either have a pitch or not, that is, it's an uh, actually sound note or a rest, which is period of time where the, the player waits, I could have a sum so that uh, the left case, when I do case analysis, has a tuple of a, cla a pitch class and a duration. And uh, the, the right case has just a duration because it's just a rest. There's no sound in uh, pitch. I can do this. I can also put an octave so that it's an actual pitch. So I have the pitch class, which is the integer of module 12, which tells me which one in the, those uh, pattern of uh, repeating pattern of uh, 12 uh, keys is the one that I want. And the octave, which tells me which which module, of repeating module is the one that I want. Um, I could also represent it like this if I want chords. So an array of tuples of pitch class and octaves and a duration. And then the rest case is basically the empty array, so I only have a duration. But this sort of gets us into the problem of uh, if I give you an array of pitch classes, what does it mean? Is it a sequence of pitch classes? Which is, I guess, the, the question that Dimitri asked. Um, is it a sequence of pitch classes, or is it uh, a chord? Uh, the pitch class is stacked one on top of the other. Which takes me to the next uh, slide. Uh, I'm not so good at, with puns, as, as you can see. <laughs> Michael, Michael is way better. And uh, and this to, I really like this view of uh, type checking, uh, which is its own form of interpretation. If you have ever written a, an interpreter for a dynamic language, for example. And uh, the, the kind of interpreter where you it's like it's uh, usually the first interpreter that you write when you're trying to play with making a language, which is it just folds over the the term and every branches on everything it finds, and then eventually it finds a literal. And then it returns that value. So let's say it found the literal 5, then returns 5. And this 5 is part of a uh, plus. So it's plus 5, 3, for example. And then you check. It's a dynamic language, so you have to check now. Is this an integer? Is this an integer? Yes, so let me sum it. Then I return. And then maybe that goes for times times eight and something else. Is this an integer? Is this an integer? I do it again. Um, and that, that, that's because you have the luxury of, it, of doing this at runtime. But if you're type checking, you're doing this at uh, compile time. So the best you can do is deal with values as abstract entities. So when you, when you, when you get to, to a literal, uh, you don't return its value. You return a description of it. So in this case, an integer. And this integer is being used by a plus operation, for example. Um, so it needs to look at the other thing. So it returns a description of the other thing. So for example, an integer. So what the plus does now, because I know that the plus expects, expects two integers, is I check it. Is this an integer? Is this an integer? OK. So then I can return an integer. I don't return the value. I just return the abstract description of the value. And this works because. Uh, I know what types the primitives in my language expect. So I can always do this abstract interpretation. And also because the types always depend only on the, the types of its sub-expressions. For example, to compute the type of a sum of integers, I don't rely on any external information. I just need to know that uh, the types of my sub-expressions. If I do. So do you have recursion? How do you solve recursion in this way? Like if you have a function called itself, how do you resolve the type of the function? 
Uh, I don't have RAM. Oh, no so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but you can, but you can, yeah. Yes. So, that in principle, uh, can return different types? Yes. Uh, and the solution is it can't. It has to return the same type. So, so okay. Good, good solution. You, you define the problem away. <laughs> Yeah, but but yeah, that's that's basically the solution, and and, it, and it's actually what uh, uh, fervent defenders of the pen, of the dynamic typing argue that you lose that if you have a static language, then your if must return always the same type, and some people find this important, which I can understand because I I like everything. I guess. <laughs> uh, okay, so these are types or at least parent classes of types, type and atomic type. These are, uh, the other two are other things that I need when I'm type checking. So, um, a type environment, and the idea of a type scheme, which is uh, a way to track which uh, parameters of types are generic, sort of. And the type environment keeps a map and a count of variables that I have seen so far, um, which uh, probably will become clearer in the following slide. Not, not this one, following slides. Um, OK, so types. I have an arrow, which is a function. It has a domain, a codomain. For example, function from int to int, from bool to int, from int to bool, whatever. I have products, which are tuples. So I have a different type, or a possibly different type for each uh, value in the tuple. I have sums, which have a different type for each case, possibly different. Um, I have maps, or I had maps. And I have uh, a type that I call abstract, which will be, I'll talk about it at the end, which is basically user-defined types, but is it really? And I have atomic types, which are, again, it's, just, it's analogous with terms, it's with are types that have no subtype. Subtypes is a loaded with that, which, which have no uh, type parameters. So for example, bool, it's a type in itself, or, or int, or unit. And I have type variables. So this is my type check function. Uh, type, type check calls type case on the, on the term, passing the same context and environment. M let star is just multiple value let. I don't know why we don't have this. Um, one more marker, I guess. And uh, generalized type is just uh, get a type and make a type scheme out of it, and then identify which variables are fit there. Could you go two slides back? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Why don't you define types that correspond to music uh, uh, objects, like an old or Duration, because here I can imagine you can yeah. make mistakes like you sum up duration and uh, each, which in principle doesn't make sense. Yes, yes, yes. That's why we have the abstract type, which will hide, hide away the implementation detail. But yes, yes, that's definitely a problem. And that's that's what I, what I was sort of hinting at with this slide, which is I have a list of pitch classes, but what does it mean? Is it a sequence of pitch classes? Is it a chord? Like a, a they are, are they played one after the other, or, or are they played simultaneously? Which was also uh, Dimitri's question. Uh, but yes, it's definitely a problem. Did, did I answer? Yeah. Okay. Same thing as uh, reduction, as normalized, that you'd call reduction step. Type check, type check, call step case. And then it sort of limits my scope of implementing a type checking function to, uh, if I have this term, how can I give it a type if it has one? One more macro, which is the equivalent of reduction rule, but for types, I won't uh, bother uh, that much, but it basically implements the method while opening the slots so that I don't have to do it myself. Convenience, I guess. These are the easy ones to type. If I get a unit, its type is unit. If I get an int, its type is int. Same thing for true and false, but uh, both are booleans. Um, if I get a free variable, I look it up in the context. If I get a bound variable, I look it up in the context. Also easy. 
if you have a compass. Tips that, that uh, maybe answers the question. Uh, and, and the answer is uh, doesn't compute. Um, if I have an if to compute its type, I try to get the type of the test. I call it test I try to get the type of the of the then branch and the type of the else branch, and I completely forgot to say this, but maybe you've noticed already because I didn't put any types in my code that the types are inferenced. Um, so that involves the process of unification. And uh, if you have annotations, what would happen at this uh, this line here is. Um, You already know the type of the test, so you can say this is a bool or not. If it isn't, you 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 abort the compilation. But right now, I may not be sure. Um, so I say, does this unify with bool? If I already know the test T has a concrete type and it's not bool, I will end the, the compilation. But if I don't, if it's a type variable or, or something like that, I record it that this type must be a bool. Um, same thing, I see if the then branch and the else branch unify. If I already know their types and they're different, this will fail. If I don't know, I record on my uh, type environment that this must be the same. And then I return, the, the whole expression has a, as a type, the type of the then, because I know at this point that it must be equal to the else. Uh, typing functions. There are no annotations, so my function starts with lambda x, for example. And at this point, I really have no idea what x is because there's no annotation and it's a variable that I just introduced. So I introduced as a type to it, for it, a type variable. So I say this, this, um, this thing has type t0 or t1 if I already have generated t0. Or T2 or T3. Uh, for the case of the code domain, that is the, the thing that the, the, the function returns, I can ask the expression, what is your type? But before I do that, I need to extend the context of uh, um, extend the context with the knowledge that my argument is has type T0, the variable that I just generated. So assuming that this variable has type T0, what type do you have? And then I return as type t arrow domain to call domain. Function application, I get, I get the type of the function. I get the type of the argument. Um, I create a type variable. And then I check if the function type, because, because the type of the argument is the type of the argument, the domain, the type of the domain. But at this point, I don't know the type of the, it's the opposite problem. I don't know the type of, uh, that the function returns. Uh, so I create a type variable for it, just so that I can build an arrow, and then ask, does the function type unify with t arrow, uh, the type of the argument, to this type variable? Uh, function to, to generate a fresh type variable basically increases the count and creates a t-var with an ID. The t and carries this count of type variables that are, were generated so far and a map of constraints. So um, every time I, what? Uh, every time I, every time I generate uh, a new constraint, and that happens when I say unify this type with this type. If one of these is a type variable or contain a type variable, but I can't at this point eliminate the, the see that anything's wrong, I say, for example, you have a function from t0 to bool, and I have function from ta to t1. And I say, sorry, type 0 to bool, and I have a function from t1 to t2, and I say, yeah, does, do these unify? Uh, and the result is, yeah, they do. But T0 must be equal to, must be the same as T1. 
and T1, uh, T2 must be bool. And I start this into the, the map that the type environment has. And this is the actual unify function. Um, it has um, many tricks. <laughs> uh, not invented by me, of course. Uh, the first thing that you do is that when you call unify, I walk over the map, getting all my type variables, what do they correspond to, what do they correspond to, until I reach something that is not a type variable. Um, and then I call the actual implementation. And then I do, OK, if my type 1 is a type variable, let me unify this variable. If my type two is a two that is a variable, let me unify these variables. Which is what I mean is let me start this constraint. Um, which is this function, um, which basically extends the type environment if the variable isn't already there. Um, it also does a check to see if a variable occurs in the other type, because then you have a bad type. Um, but that's, I won't go that much into detail, but that's basically what you're doing. Every time you call unify, if you can't eliminate the type that you got at this point, you start a constraint. Um, and you start constraints in a certain way, and in a certain way involve, involves doing this, uh, this walk over the, the constraints that you have already until you reach the last one, every time you get a variable, so that you can always do this. And then you always get the most general type. And uh, I forgot to increase the font after the, the, the big code. Uh, so if I have a function, this is another command, I call check, and it tells me the type of the thing. If I try to get the type of lambda xx, the, the identity function, it tells me this is from t0 to t0 because there's no constraint. Really, this function can be applied to any type and it will work. Because I'm not summing, I'm not uh, applying, I'm not doing anything. So if, if I only want to do nothing, anything works. Um, and that's how, which Something that I find really nice is that time inference leads really straightforwardly to generic types without anger. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do lambda x with uh, two, that is a function that always returns true no matter what you give it, its type is t0 from t0 to int, because no matter what you give it, it will return true. Lambda x, y returns x, it's from t0 to t1, returns t0. And if you remember that a function is basically, a function of multiple arguments is basically a function of one argument that leads to a function of one argument that leads to a function of one argument, until it stops with something that is in the function, this, this sort of way of not make, notating the types make more sense, makes more sense. So I, I, I think it's called const or constant. I think common is curry. Oh no, yeah, no, this is curry. Yeah, but I mean, I think common list has this function, right? Constantly. Constantly, yeah. So you give it a value, and then no matter what you give it later, it always returns the first value. So and the type, the type uh, tells me that you give it to zero, and then no matter what t one you gave, you always get to zero. Uh, function application lambda x y. The, the constantly function on the x, y always return x, apply to true, gives me a function from t1 to bool, because since I already applied the first argument, I know that t0 is bool. And also I, I, I eliminated one argument from the function already. Uh, lambda x, if x then one else zero, since the x is being used there, I know that I expect a bool. And it returns an int, because both branches return their, an int. If they return different things, they wouldn't touch it. This is also a nice one. Lambda f x, if f of x, then 1, else 0. 
So I know that my function gets something and returns a bool because the result is in the check. Uh, so I get a function from t0 to bool. I get a t0 and I return an int. Um, and this sort of tells you that you can abstract away things as long as you get the functions that compute on the things as parameters because then you don't care what it is. Sort of how the, the map function works, for example. It's the function that you get as parameter that really cares about what it is. You only care that it's a list. It doesn't really matter if it's a list of ints, a list of pools. Yes? If there's a dead hole in, in a function, does it do the type check and in, in the type inference? There's a what, dead code. The code that is never run. That never runs. Uh, uh, yes, it still does. So yeah, it's, it's a problem. So if there's a type error in the dead code, it, it, it will not type check. It will not type check. Yeah, it's limited in that uh, regard. Uh, yeah, and this is how you define, this is maybe sort of alleviates your concern. This is how you define abstract things. Yeah. You, t you say, I'm defining an abstract, uh, I call it mod 12, because I want to model each classes, for example, or things that are module 12 but are not necessarily type classes, which do exist if you talk to serial composers. Uh, And in this context, up to the end, uh, literally, uh, if you call define, your, in, in this context, you have to give the types. So if they won't be, at least at the top level, they, they won't be inferred. And uh, inside this block, mod 12 is uh, an alias for int. And how does it know this? Because it it knows that it sees that you're consistent on all definitions that it's always been used as an int, otherwise it doesn't compile. Uh, but as soon as you leave this block, mod 12 is opaque, so no one knows that it's an int, and the only thing that you're left to play with mod 12s are the functions that are defined here. And it's it's this is to me something that is beautiful because my my runtime, my evaluation engine engine doesn't care about this at all. Only, it will only see ints. But bad programs that, that try to treat mod 12s as ints, that is, without going through these functions, these, these blast functions, won't compile. Because when I look up the type uh, of these functions, they are an F bar, so I look up in the context, I will know that the type is mod 12, it's not int. So if I try to use it as an int, it won't uh, unify, won't type check. Um, and there, there's a, a a little bit more sugar, which is I can register an int reader, um, which is I, if you call register int reader uh, and a function from int to something, you can set your context with a call uh, set int reader um, so that the integer literals are read as this type. So that you don't always have to keep calling conversion functions if you, if in this piece of code you're always dealing with each classes, for example, you can say one, two, three, four. It's an implicit conversion. Yes, but compile them. Yeah. Uh, as in, uh, you can't mix them, I guess. Um, what you can also do that this example doesn't show is that it doesn't need necessarily to be int to the type that you're defining, it can be int. So the type that you're defining uh, summed with a uh, unit. Uh, so it's either uh, left case, your type, right case, unit, which is the value that carries no information. And then at compile time, I know that your, your, the integral literal isn't a valid member of your type, or at least doesn't compute to that eventually. Um, so for example, if I want to define a type for um, for mod 12, it makes sense because if I write 13, I'll take the mod, it's one. But for example, if I try to define an abstract type for positive numbers, and someone writes minus one, I want a compile type error. Um, and I will know that it's a compile time error because your function will return the right range. Um, structure methods, such as, such as the additive rhythm, which, which is the one that I used, 
they just register the types that they support. So the additive uh, rhythm registered the the rhythm type and the array of rhythm types, array of rhythms type. The first one it interprets as a line. The second one it interprets as uh, multiple lines play, being played together. Uh, but for example, you can re this is this, re this registration is done in common list, so you have to implement a, a common list function, and then you call a, a function saying I, I support this list of types, and if someone wants to extract one of these types with me, you give it a name, uh, then you call this function with the syntax tree of the thing. And then the extraction method is responsible for doing its thing. Its thing. So you can have a, a, an, uh, an extraction method to generate a score with pitches, for example, I only did rhythms, um, to generate maybe a C sound score, uh, I don't know, it's a modern argument. Yeah, so to conclude, um, indexing, and I end up talking about it uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, I'm indexing everything that you do. So like, um, every type that you define, I index it. Uh, every uh, sorry, every value that you define, every constant that you define, uh, or function, or anything, basically, I index it with with its type. So I every all the time I know. Uh, you can ask, give me all constants with this type, uh, and I also index which value uses which. Letter. And this is something that I'm still uh, implementing further uh, because I want to define, I want to index also content of things. And since I know that at the end everything boils down to integers, I can do this so that eventually you can ask, give me this sequence of integers that has this uh, snippet because then I can look for, for music uh, that is similar to something, for example, while I'm developing my program. Uh, Refine. Um, which is analogous to define, which is cool. Uh, you can leave slots instead of putting values, and it will tell you this value should have this type. This is something that I, I mean, working in parallel with the indexing thing. This value should have this type. These are the values of this type that you have in scope, or the functions that eventually compute to this type. Because then, if you select this function, you can. Uh, fill the arguments as you go, uh, extracting code. So you can also register a method, extraction method for a function type. So uh, instead of getting a sequence of integers that you think is a reason and, and you make it so, you get a, a syntax tree that corresponds to a function and you extract to your favorite language. And this is something that I want to do because I want to play with this, but then I have colleagues that are uh, uh, code in other languages, and they maybe they want a function to compute uh, the normal form of each class set, and then I have it here, so I can extract this to this other language. And since my language has such a simple semantics, it should be pretty straightforward to translate to most languages with cadets. And that's it. What's your, what's your end goal with it, with, with this, with this, with this uh, creation? Um, yeah, so I want, the, 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 in short, is I want to compute in the same way that I pen in paper. I want to, to, to there, there are lots of software for music and programming languages for music. I can recommend a bunch of them because I use them. Um, and they're all very good. But there's none that subscribes to my inclinations, basically. Uh, and that, 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 that's maybe the main reason. But also because I want to, as I said, I often use pen and paper as a way to, 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 to augment my, my intelligence, to make notes, to scribble, and all that. And I want that in a programming environment. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm going to get there, but I'm, I want to play with the idea in, in a simple language is, is uh, will 
I suppose, allow me to focus on these other things while knowing that it's enough because I have experience in this uh, uh, music field uh, and I know that it's uh, common to do these operations on integers because you're doing analysis with pitch class sets and with uh, this sort of representation for rhythms and all, all that, at least for a, for a certain subset of uh, music or musicology. Um, but yeah, I want to, to have an environment that helps me think. And, and speaking of, of thinking, like uh, for me at least, uh, the code that was written it was much farther, uh, farther from actual music uh, notation as we see it uh, in terms of notes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, how, uh, do you have a way to print it as a like a sheet of, uh, of notes uh, to see uh, how it actually looks like? Or yeah. yeah um... So, and also, if you change the variable, so you, I guess you, you should be able to print it again to see how actually. It yeah. Is. Yeah. So in principle, you're interacting with this. This is not a. That's what I want to avoid, and what I, I've been avoiding so far, successfully, even though it's not complete. Um, this is not a piece of code that you submit, and then two days later you get the result on the mainframe. This is uh, you evaluate it as you go. Um, so if you want to see the result of what you have so far, you just call extract canon, for example, with additive rhythm, or maybe with a full, full score extractor that takes a, a more uh, dense, uh, complete specification of a piece of music, um, and then print that. Right now, I only have things for rhythms, and this is uh, um, this is uh, extracted from this with this additive rhythm uh, extraction method. Um, and it's actually the, the, the extraction method that is uh, responsible for actually generating the LilyPond code. I, I have no, I as in the course, has no idea of what's LilyPond or, or whatever. It just passes the syntax tree to the, to the extraction method and then it does its thing. Um, I can imagine, and in fact, I will do this, because why not? Um, do an extraction method that takes what I thought was music as I was developing, but it's just a list of pairs of integers and uh, prints them out as lines using Cairo or library or something like that, just to see what comes out of it. Yeah, so you can basically do whatever. Can you convert it to music as well? The actual sound, I mean? Currently, no, but it is feasible to implement an extraction method that writes a MIDI file, for example. Or, or LilyPond is able to generate MIDI files, so if uh, right now, we want to do this. You can do it like this, and then do it externally. But but yeah, in principle, it's possible. I would uh, venture a guess that a large uh, piece of code you can show us is the synthesis parser. Uh, do you actually use this for it, or do you do you some standard library? Uh, no, no, no. That? My my standard library is the read table. I just uh, if if you know, the 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 common read table for for for. For those that uh, don't know about it, and I actually don't know much about it, I try, 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 and it works, and I don't touch it. <laughs> uh, it just uh, disable. It's sort of a, a data structure that Lisp itself uses uses to parse it, parse itself, or whatever you call read upon, and then you can make a copy of it, or create a new read table, and make alterations. So the first thing first thing you do, if you want to parse other things, is you disable everything that it has. Because because it parses uh, it parses on spaces, so I guess if you put yeah, that, if I remove a space there, that doesn't work anymore, right? That I did. Uh, um, define, so I, I, let's say define a uh, no space double dot uh, equals no, double dot anymore. I don't understand. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, a, a double dot. So between the a and uh, assignment operator, if I remove the space. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. It doesn't um, because because you can make it special. So for the things that I want to be special, I re-enable them. Not re-enable, but I, I make it do what I want to do most of the time. Uh, and it sort of works. But, but yeah, you disable everything that, that it does. For example, parsing codes and parsing, parsing uh, the pound sign, sharp sign, uh, the parentheses and everything. And then you, you, you set, I think it set special character uh, so that when it finds this character, it calls your your function, 
And um, so, for example, the colon is special. I treat it specially, of course. Uh, some other things that are important to me as well, like coma and uh, I don't know. Recently, right. you actually wanted to avoid uh, S expressions, or like why to go with this syntax and not just this syntax? Um, good question. Where does? Yeah, actually, to be honest, I haven't settled on a syntax yet. I'm playing. Yeah. Because also, for example, relating that to the evaluation, I really like the, the fact that you go like step by step. Yeah. I think that actually you can explore maybe the consequences, like have like continuations, like if you stop or something in the middle. That's very interesting. But actually, that maps very well to the macro expansion, right? Yeah. Because you also macro expand step by step. Yeah. So maybe instead of these classes, you can just treat this into macros and just macro expand to evaluate. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, but uh, I, I haven't, I, the, the truth is I haven't decided on a syntax yet. I'm considering doing a structure editor so that um, you don't deal with it directly with text. Uh, I probably won't do it. Um, but yeah, I haven't decided on a syntax yet and I've been struggling with how, how where it goes for, but but the good thing is that you can always play with the abstract syntax tree as Lisp, Lisp shows us. So maybe eventually I will go back and do that. Yeah, I don't know. There's no real, um, I prefer this. It's just, a, I'm playing around. So correctly, to compile it, you just uh, run uh, extract code and then uh, your program generates, let's say, C, C program, judging by the introduction, right? In the introduction, you hold a piece of C code to which it compiles, and then you compile it, right? So uh, no, the, the, I just run Lisp here. No, no, I just run Lisp. Um, the, the, the compilation is basically type checking, evaluating, and storing the, the constants, like storing the, the variables. Um, and if you ha if you ask for it to be extracted, then it will sort of compile to something different, um, which in this case, for example, is a score, like a musical score with just a percussive musical score. Um, with more sophisticated extract methods that I want to implement, I will compile to... to, to okay, so in fact, was, was a joke, what, yeah. What are you? <laughs> no, ah. it was a lie. Can you compile the C yet? Well, uh, every program will compile basically to main. Yeah, exactly. That was my point. That was a joke. <laughs> because since of <I'll>, since of. <laughs> so, uh, since there's no input, no output, all programs are constants. Yes. If I do this two optimization passes, constant folding, and that code elimination, all my programs will compile to this. <laughs> but uh, the, the, but yeah. still, it might not compile. Not, not type check and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if it gets to so compile. there's a point. Yeah, yeah there is a point. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 it's a little too old. That's why my next question is like, show us the C code for the last the, the score. The compiler is very simple. So it just says <laughs> cat on this. Like, this one to add the instruments to the notation. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Here you have three lines, and uh, could be played by three people. Could be played by one person. That uh, it could be perception is difficult to interpret. Uh, but not necessarily excellent. Um, but um, what I pass to the extraction method is when I call extract canon with additive rhythm is an array of rhythms and then the extraction method is the one that sort of interprets the data as uh, three things being played simultaneously and generate a score for that. Um, so Let's say that, for example, I'm writing a piece for a, a group of percussionists. I can do an extraction method that uh, already assigns different instruments to them. It's, uh, or maybe if I 
really want to do it, I can encode them as integers on on on, uh, on the actual language, and then pass it to the extraction method that sort of knows what they stand for. But can't you don't have any annotation except the octave and the don? No, no. I, uh, in, in principle, they're just integers. I, I set out to do something for music. But technically, you can encode any instrument as an octave. So octave 100 means like one instrument, 200 another instrument. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> or I can add, uh, like, my tuples are, I can have as many elements as I want. I can add an, a new integer. Of course, I need to rewrite or, or write a new extraction uh, method, and then it will work. Allow me to update you to get something uh, reasonably working. It's, I don't know, maybe. How long did you start playing? Uh, sorry? Sorry? What? How long did we, did, we, did we start playing this? Uh... Uh, I think it was uh, mid June, maybe. Uh, yeah, when I told you that oh, I have something to, to talk about. Okay, then. <laughs> yeah, but what I have so far is uh, just uh, is the language. Um, it sort of spins up a server, and you can uh, server, and you can call these things um, um, like you can tell it to do these things, and then it tells you the result and, and stores whatever it needs to store. Um, I already have the some of the indexing. I don't have the refine yet. Um, the next step for me, besides these more core things like the refine command and stuff like that, is actually integrated with an editor. Because right now, uh, I can I tell it to evaluate, and it evaluates, and it returns me a result, but the result is a block of text that Emacs doesn't know what it means. In some, uh, can you give some like uh, maybe hypothetical or practical examples of, of, of an actual person who's sitting down to do an analysis task? Like, what, what kind of, or is it more composition, or is it like I have a piece of music and I want to find patterns in it or something? Like, what, what kind of? Um, okay. Um, yeah. So this example actually is from uh, the technique of my the technique of my musical language, uh, which is a, a book from, uh, by uh, Olivier Messiaen, it's a French composer. Um, and he's, uh, he's describing how to build up rhythms to make a uh, canon. Um, and it's how to build up a rhythm with uh, like a, a, a three note cell, and then you do variations of it, and then you put them together, and then you put one on top of the other delay, and then have a canon. So if you have that type of workflow, then this works. Um, where, where you build out things uh, in this manner. Um, so uh, like you, you, let's say that you have a, a library already built in, like already built, that does operations like, like the ones I have here, like diminished rhythm, augment rhythm, uh, uh, reverse rhythm, um, you have pitches, you know, maybe you transpose, you invert, you also retrograde, all these contrafunctional uh, techniques. Um, and you can splice them together, you can uh, put them on top of one another. And um, yeah, if you have this type of workflow, then as a composer, you can do this. For an analyst, which is uh, something that I care about, because uh, it's actually usually more difficult to make a good tool, I think, or at least. That has been my experience so far. Um, for example, you have tools like Open Music. Is, uh, oh, I should have said I should have said that. But Lisp has a really stronger presence in the music and computing scene, which is uh, maybe unexpected, but uh, yay for history. Uh, 
so you have this great uh, software called Open Music. It's uh, open source, uh, or maybe yeah, it's open source, written in Common Lisp, um, and it has this immense array of tools and extensions and plugins and, and whatever. And people do comp like uh, big name composers uh, write music with it. Uh, people do analysis on it. I have a, I have a there's a, it's a French uh, musician. But that lives in Brazil. He has a really good book called uh, "Statics of Sonority" or something like that in English, um, where he uh, uses open music. Uh, using open music isn't the point of this book, but he he does really good analysis of the DC of uh, Messiaen, I think Lachemann, uh, maybe some other composer, and he uses this tool to analyze the density of the sounds in the score and the kind of things very numerically heavy, um, but he actually extracts extracts nice. Uh, Nice information that is palatable, that like uh, describing that you have a mass of sound and, and it's uh, close together with uh, maybe with something that has concentration of uh, uh, frequencies that's another range, and then you have contrasts and all that. Uh, and if you want to do that, 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 that tool is actually really good. But I still get a feeling that for for analysis, you have a lot of, a lot of batch tools, like. Uh, it's a tool that is really good, has a lot of knowledge built in. You, you, you tell it to run, and then it gives you a result, and then you interpret away from the computer, and you take your conclusions, and that's really good. But I wanted something that is more of an interactive thing. So uh, that, that's one of the reasons that I'm indexing uh, things, it's based on five, for example, uh, so that as a start, you write out the whole section of piece that you're trying to analyze, or maybe you generate it from MIDI or something, like a natural term, with, which is an array of integers or tuples of integers and integers and whatever. Um, and then uh, I have indexed already, for example, all the transformations from uh, sequences of pitches to sequences of pitches, for example. So, Maybe I have functions that that uh, transpose that refer that uh, do transformations that I know are common to this style, for example. And since I have since I have indexed them according to certain criteria, I can I want to be able to select a piece of a piece of the of the text of the music that I, I have encoded in full, like a, a literal, and then uh, tell me what are the outputs of the functions that I have of this type if I call it with this. Because then maybe I can see that if I transpose this and then revert it and then multiply it, which is an actual operation rather than one with another piece of music, uh, I apply all of this. It sounds similar. It resembles this other piece, an inter uh, this other part of the music, and interactively I'll be able to see this and uh, guide my analysis process in that direction. So yeah, ideally, eventually I would build some automation tool. Uh, like a sledgehammer approach, try all this bunch of things that I know that have worked for composers of this style. Uh, yes, or uh, which is a uh, really good uh, idea. Um, yeah, so it's because, for example, I was I was. Trying to, I was thinking of including a, a small analysis here, but uh, I, I didn't find a, a piece that was both small and uh, that I could explain. I didn't want to do, to uh, go that deep into that into into the in the talk, but uh, also because I don't know how to use this yet. It's pretty new. Uh, but yeah. There are certain composers or certain schools of composition that uh, have a very uh, clear, not clear, have a very distinct way of composing that could be analyzed with the help of a tool like this. So, as it is now, if we, if I build more features or more, maybe a bigger library, I could tackle bigger, not bigger, different projects. But maybe composers that use a lot of symmetry. Um, that saturate their motives a lot, 
So they take a small cell and they really extract all they can from that. So uh, make it longer, uh, splice it up into pieces and use them, recombine them. Because then it will be, it will be, it will eventually boil down to a set of operations on a piece of maybe of a, an array of three elements, let's say. And then I, uh, as I call, and that's 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 the that's the, one of the reasons for that for implementing this as a single stepping thing. Um, is that when I tell it, okay, single step through this or or single step n times, I want to see the cell have a bunch of functions applied to it be gradually transformed into the into the resulting piece of music and learn something from it as a musician. Because because uh, it's very maybe it's a stretch to say that it's very similar, but it sort of resembles some style like uh, basically binding and replacement of things, which is what you do with the I guess with this functional style of music. Um, it's similar to some styles of analysis where you say, okay, let me call this, this snippet of the music A, because I know that it uses, that the composer uses it uh, on the next section, but transform. So I'll call this other A prime. So if I have a function that maps A to A prime, I can already encode this section of music as A, and then F apply to A. Uh, and then A followed by F applied to A, the analyst will call section A, or better name, section B. It's a, it's a higher level thing. Um, section one, different name thing. And, and then uh, for me, it will be maybe a variable. And it's a, they sort of, Relate because it's basically giving names to things and abstracting it out. And uh, as the analysts do this, sometimes they actually, actually, it's sort of common that you, okay, this is A, this is A prime, and I call this A prime because it's basically A, but they did, but the composer did this to it. So that's why I call A prime because there's a relation. So I want to express these relations, and, and uh, for this kind of analysis, maybe it will, it will work out eventually. Not sure if that's correct. Probably. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.